well, um, thank you very much. It's uh, really nice to, to have the opportunity to speak here, and I thank Jeff very much for um, inviting me. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to visit Boston. Um, I actually don't come to Boston very often, <laughs> it turns out. And so, uh, it's good to have an excuse. Um, so, I hope, I don't know whether you can hear me, whether it's better if I'm here or here. Does it make any difference? No. It's okay. I uh, mean, it's bad either way. That's bad. Okay, so I'm talking about, I thought this would be a good opportunity to reflect a little on the connections between corporate finance and, and contracts. Because um, I have thought about both topics uh, during my career. Um, I actually started off being interested in the objective functions of firms and then um, was led to consider the financial structure first before I got into um, contract theory. Um, so the, the literatures um, didn't really initially have much overlap. I would say that the um, corporate finance literature actually start, you know, has a, a longer history. Uh, contract theory is fairly recent. Um, and corporate finance has been traditionally about large companies, uh, where I think, you know, thinking about things contractually doesn't seem um, so natural. It's not the first thing you think about. But in recent years, uh, there's been a shift, and uh, now I think when we when we talk about corporate finance, we also include things like um, startups, venture capital, entrepreneurship, and it's in these sort of smaller companies or smaller uh, ventures that can, um, contractual arrangements seem to be uh, immediately uh, very important. They're at the fore. Now, okay, just going back then with a little, to a little bit of history, and you think about, uh, I mean, this is a, um, a very quick sketch, and of course you, you know all about this, much more than I do. I mean, it started, you could say, the, the corporate finance literature started um, seriously with Modigliani and Miller, um, their famous um, article arguing that um, under certain conditions, financial structure doesn't matter at all, which I think came as a great shock to the profession and, and uh, to practitioners, who probably immediately disagreed with it. Um, then they themselves and others pointed out that this uh, neutrality result was no longer true if we um, uh, allow for taxes, then, then financial structure does matter, there's some advantage to debt. Then along came Jensen and Mecklin uh, with the, the agency perspective saying that what, uh, even in the absence of taxes, we have to worry about um, whether managers will misbehave and that uh, debt may be a good way to stop them misbehaving or uh, give them an incentive not to misbehave. And then the situation they considered was someone who is uh, wants to expand the company he or she is um, running, and the question is, do you issue equity or do you issue debt? If you are the 100% owner um, and you issue equity, then your, your stake is diluted, and so you will no longer have an incentive to behave uh, efficiently. Uh, if, in contrast, you borrow, then um, you still have the 100% stake, and so at the margin, you are the residual claimant and you, your incentives remain strong. So that was a, a benefit to issuing debt. Um, but then the downside was that if you had a lot of debt, um, then the debt became risky, and now um, there was an incentive to engage in, in risk-taking activities because you were the major equity holder still. So, okay, very familiar, um, and, but I just I say it anyway. Um, then there was, a, I just want to mention, you know, a second view, which is, uh, well, I mean, one of the issues about that view is it really seems to apply to companies with major shareholders. It doesn't seem, you know, the manager starts off with 100% and the question is whether uh, his stake is going to go down a bit. It doesn't seem to apply um, directly to um, large public companies, which I 
small stakes. So, you know, what, what about that? Can one do something about that and tell a story for those companies as well? Well, this is something um, that uh, Sandy Grossman and I started thinking about, and then um, Jensen, of course, has this famous uh, free cash flow paper. And basically, the idea is that you can think of debt as a bonding device, even if a manager um, doesn't have a large equity stake, um, perhaps has, has a zero equity stake. Um, if uh, the manager just has a large number of shareholders uh, as investors, then the manager could uh, really do nothing, could slack completely. And what's going to happen with dispersed shareholders, um, of course, there could be activist investors as there are nowadays, or hostile takeovers. But those are kind of expensive things to um, carry out. And so a lot of the time, you've got these dispersed shareholders who are not doing much, and you, as the manager, can do what you like. Well, bring in some debt, and now you have a hard a budget constraint. Um, and so this is the sort of bonding theory of debt, and that can explain, you know, Jensen argued to it, why, um, you know, it's a way to force companies to uh, pay out free cash flow instead of doing silly things with it. Um, the penalty for misbehaving in that world is that you may not be able to pay your debts and you may uh, go bankrupt, which is assumed to be unpleasant for management. Okay, so this is history. It's uh, actually quite ancient history. Um, but it, I wanted to get it on the table because I'm going to... You know, it's a good I want to move on from there, because uh, one of the criticisms of that story is, um, and again, it's probably well known to you, I've written about it, other people have written about it, um, is that it seems to be, um, you, you are trying to solve an agency problem with company financial structure, and that seems a very crude way of doing things because, you know, there's another part of the literature that was developing around the same time. So, uh, so this is, you could say, part of contract theory, principal agent theory, started after uh, Modigliani and Miller, but actually before um, Jensen and Meckling. And um, this is I mean, classical principal agent theory says, yes, agency problems are very important, but um, the natural way to solve them is through incentive schemes. And so if we apply that to this context, then the natural solution would be for them to put the manager on some sort of incentive scheme. So this is the, a well-known critique of Jensen and Meckling, which a number of people have made. And it is, you know, if you want, why not have that company, which is, is uh, wants to expand, instead of the manager issuing debt, um, in order to preserve his incentives, why don't we instead have the manager issue equity, but then put himself on some uh, high-powered incentive scheme, which still gets him to work hard. So we can, in principle, completely separate um, incentivizing management, management, which we can do through an incentive scheme, uh, from the company's financial structure. Um, it would seem that that uh, would be uh, a simpler, a better way of doing things. Um, it's sort of use, like using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, the, uh, the financial structure approach as opposed to the um, incentive scheme approach. Um, if we take the, the, the second line of literature, the bonding literature, um, the critique there would be um, that we're sort of using the nuclear option of a costly default. I hesitate, by the way, to use the word nuclear these days because it actually uh, really does seem to be a serious uh, thing. <laughs> you know, one used to perhaps be a little jokey about it, but I don't quite feel that way now. But anyway, I haven't got a better word. So um, it seems that, um, you know, bankruptcy, the idea, if you take it to its logical extreme, then debt is motivating managers who don't have a significant um, equity stake in the firm. Uh, nonetheless, it's motivating them because if they fail to pay their debts, they go bankrupt, and if they go bankrupt, you know, their firm explodes basically and they're out of a job. Um, and it seems then that um, having this, I'm going to call it the nuclear option, um, 
to motivate managers, again, seems very crude. Why would we want to set a, to have the world uh, operate that way? Couldn't we do better? Uh, wouldn't there be some alternative shareholder um, governance arrangement that would be better? Um, and sort of somewhat related to this, uh, a lot of people have been interested in designing efficient bankruptcy procedures. I actually played around with this a bit myself uh, some decades ago, but there were many other people involved in trying to come up with a better bankruptcy procedure than Chapter 11, say. And of course, that activity has had, uh, there's been renewed energy since the financial crisis because um, uh, we saw that people were, were very reluctant to let um, large financial institutions enter Chapter 11. And so, you know, that raised the question, well, um, if people really don't trust a chapter, uh, chapter 11, couldn't they uh, come up with something better? In any event, if you think uh, that literature is all about making the what happens when bankruptcy occurs not so awful, not uh, destructive to the value of the firm, and therefore also probably not destructive to the careers of managers, because you know if they're the best people to run the company, then in, a, in an efficient bankruptcy procedure, we might well be keeping them on. So it isn't really such a penalty uh, to uh, default. Um, okay, so this I, I see this literature as um, you know raising as as, as many uh, questions as as answers, and so um, I think. Problems is that actually large public companies are very complicated objects. Uh, maybe that's not. If you're trying to theorize about um, the financial structure of companies, maybe um, it's easier to start with something simpler, which is uh, a small company. And you know, the simplest thing you could possibly imagine is one entrepreneur and one investor. And that is what the financial contracting literature has been has been about, and you can see this as a, some, a subset of the contracting literature, which really started with uh, the well-known paper of Rob Townsend in, um, I think it was 1979, costly state verification, and then there was a Gail Helwig in 85, um, Innes, uh, so those were papers about um, uh, asymmetric information, then the, um, the literature evolved, uh, with papers on moral hazard by Innes and Holmstrom and Tyrol, and then there was um, an incomplete contracting part of the literature, which starts with Agnon Bolton, and uh, John Moore and I uh, also worked on that. Um, so, I'm going to now, what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is I, I've given you a little bit of history of the corporate finance literature, um, and now I'm going to spend a little time on this financial contracting literature, and then I'm going to go back and sort of see um, whether that can help us to think about the, uh, the large company case in a somewhat uh, new way. So, okay, the financial contracting literature, what are the main takeaways from this literature? Um, here are a few that I think are important. Um, first of all, um, the optimal contract between an entrepreneur and an investor um, is typically not going to look like, like a combination of debt and equity. There are, there are some special cases where it will look like that, but um, you know, it's a lesson from principal agent theory that the optimal contract can be very complicated, and it often is the case here. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that when we're trying to design this contract to incentivize the entrepreneur, but also to allow the investor to break even, um, dividing up future cash flow rights is not the only thing that matters. It's also important to allocate control rights appropriately between the parties. So this is the, what I think the incomplete contracting part of the literature has added to the discussion. Um, and this, as I say, starts off, this application of incomplete contracts to uh, finance starts with the contribution of Agnew and Bolton. Um, so why do control rights matter over and above uh, cash flow rights? Um, well, the reason is that financial contracts, like many other kinds of contracts, are often seriously incomplete. 
Um, and this certainly seems to be true of contracts between um, entrepreneurs and investors. Let's take uh, entrepreneurs and venture capitalists, as in startups. So this is something that Kaplan and Stromberg uh, studied in their um, in 2003 review of the economic studies paper, and they have some other papers. They actually looked at the deals um, struck between entrepreneurs and venture capitalists, and they found that the contracts written are quite elaborate, but they are seriously uh, incomplete, and that the way these parties try to complete the contract is through allocating votes and board seats. So it turns out it's, it's, it's more complicated than the simple theory would suggest where you just, uh, it's just a matter of whether I have control or you have control, or whether I have the votes or you have the votes. Um, we, can, we can allocate control in more subtle ways. Um, we, we allocate votes, but we also allocate board seats separately of the votes. And I think, and I'm sure, you know, you've been following this and you probably know more about it than I do, but if you think about what's happening uh, at Uber uh, with um, Travis Kalanick uh, and, and what his um, ouster initially, but then he seems to be struggling to retain power. And then there are other people who seem to be other um, investors there uh, who are trying to uh, reduce his power. Um, reading about it in the papers, it sounds quite fascinating. I don't quite understand how it, you know, a group is able to actually take control away from somebody, but maybe they can. I don't know, it would be nice to, to be uh, a fly uh, on the wall there, or also look at the contracts that they have. But anyway, the battle for control there certainly seems to be um, uh, hot, intense. Um, so but we as economists can see why, um, the, why the allocation of control uh, can be important in the world of incomplete contracts. Um, the entrepreneur, uh, let's say I'm the entrepreneur, you're the venture capitalist, um, we, we, get, we divide up the cash flow rights and we spend a lot of time thinking about how much I have to give you, whether it should be uh, shares or preferred shares or convertible for preferred shares and all that sort of thing. But then we come to um, who's going to be uh, in control of the company, who's going to uh, be on the board and all this sort of thing. And I would like, as the entrepreneur, would like control. Why? Well, probably because I have goals for the venture that are somewhat different from yours. So you as the venture capitalist may only be interested in the money you're going to make from this, uh, particularly if it's a huge success, you know, you're going to um, do extremely well. Um, but I may, and of course I presume you also would like to rich in that situation, but I'm interested in other things. I'm interested in the idea. Um, it's my baby, this project. You know, it's a bit like writing an academic paper. Um, you really care about it um, for all sorts of reasons, and you probably wouldn't want to um, relinquish control of it, over, over its destiny to somebody else. I don't know whether that's a very good analogy. I find it a helpful one, but perhaps someone who actually is involved in this business would say it isn't such a good one. But um, to me, uh, when you read about some of these entrepreneurs, they have dreams, and it's not just about becoming wealthy, it's sometimes about changing the world, maybe finding a cure uh, for some disease or something like that. And um, that means that, um, okay, so I think of it as, it's, it's my baby, I want some say in how it grows up, or if it grows up at all, if it's going to be, you know, strangled at some stage, you know, um, I would like to be the one who decides that that should happen. Um, now, you want control, presumably, because um, at some point, you know, I have my dreams, but if we're losing lots of money, um, then you want to be able to step in and stop the, um, the losses. Um, and you may even, even if you're not going to close the thing down, you may decide that we actually we should be pursuing a different direction from the one I think is the right one. And you may even think that, um, and actually probably you will think if we're going to pursue a different direction, that I may not be the right person to lead the company anymore. We need somebody new. And 
So you would like to be able to have the power to change the direction of the company and possibly replace me as CEO. But obviously, I'm not very happy about that. So we have this conflict, and how do we resolve it? Notice, I mean, just to make the trivial point, in a classic complete contracting world, this contract would this conflict wouldn't exist because the contract would specify ex exactly under what circumstances we should change direction or I should be replaced. So we wouldn't there wouldn't be any discretion. We would just go and consult the contract and see, ah, in this state of the world, Oliver has to go. But that's not the, the world we live in. Instead, that decision is going to be made by whoever has control, and that's why control is uh, important here. Um, but the thing is, if I have complete control, which would allow me to pursue my dreams, um, the problem is, um, because I'm going to pursue them too much, even when they're not profitable, um, you may not be willing to um, invest in the project. So I mean, that's the basic trade-off is, um, you know, if I had all the money and I didn't need you, I would retain all the control and I, I would be able to um, determine the destiny of the company 100%. But the problem is that in order to persuade you to put up money, I'm not just going to have to allocate cash flow rights to you. Typically, I'm going to have to give you some control rights as well. This is basically the point of the annual uh, Bolton paper. But then I come back to my question. Um, how do we divvy up the control? Typically, I don't want to give you all the control. That's going too far. But I can't retain it all myself. So. Um, how do we compromise? Well, one way we could do it is by um, sharing the people on the board. We could each have um, some ability to determine the board members. And I think you, you see arrangements like that. I might be able to um, nominate some people for the board, and you, as the venture capitalist, could nominate others. And then we might have some independent people, and then we would rely on, each of us rely on our ability to persuade them um, in order to um, to break deadlocks. So that's one way you, we can share control. Another way, suggested by Agnon Bolton, is to have some sort of state contingent control. So to set things up so that if things are going well, then I, the entrepreneur, can call the shots. I have a majority of the board. But that if um, things don't go so well, if I fail to meet certain targets, then you get the right to appoint more people to the board and eventually you will have control and you can replace me. And these targets um, will be not that I fail to make a debt payment, um, not least because in a lot of these new um, enterprises, uh, we're not making money initially, so there's no, no payments to be made, but it's going to be something more subtle, like whether I um, get approval from the FDA for some drug within a certain period of time. Um, so these will be the, the events, the, the benchmarks. If I, if I make the benchmark, I keep the majority of the board, but if I fail to make it, um, the, then you get control. Um, well, in, interestingly, and I think importantly for the theory, um, well, I didn't say, but Kaplan and Stromberg's paper, one of the important things about it, was that they found that, that these, this is what we actually see in reality. We do see these um, people putting in the contract uh, mechanisms so that control moves from the entrepreneur to the venture capitalist if certain benchmarks are not met. And cash flow rights also uh, move according to certain benchmarks. And um, in particular, a fairly robust result is that if things really go badly, the venture capitalist acquires a, a complete control and can then decide what to do uh, with the, the company. Okay, so this is, this is what the kind of insight you get from studying the, the small numbers case. And now I want to come back to, okay, well, can we apply this sort of thing to the public companies. Um, and the problem is it's not so easy to do it because um, the classic US or UK style public company has one share, one vote. I mean, that at least historically has been the case. Management has a very small equity share and formal control 
is held by the public shareholders. So, um, if we think about we, uh, debt in a public company, um, and, and we try to imagine, oh, I should have said perhaps when I was, sorry, I, I, I guess I missed something out there, which is to say that um, sometimes, I, I said the change of control can happen because you fail to meet a benchmark, but now if we consider particularly uh, companies which are a bit more mature than these startups, where uh, cash flows are earned, then um, a simple way of having state future control, control is through a debt contract. Um, so with a debt contract, um, I promise to make some payments to you, and if I fail to make them, then control um, obviously moves from me to you. Okay, so I want you to have that in mind. We have this more general uh, way of shifting control, but a special and interesting case, um, and we certainly see it in uh, small companies, maybe not startups, but uh, things which are a little further along, we might see the triggering event being a failure to make a, de a, a, a debt payment. And so now, with that, okay, now I want to go back to the public companies and go back to, oh, these companies have equity and debt, can we um, think of debt in the same way as for the small companies? And the difficulty is, this is what I was saying here, is you can't really argue that management loses control, the public lo com company loses control if it fails to make a repayment, since it never had really had control in the first place. Um, at best, you can argue that it loses, uh, perhaps we make the distinction between formal authority and real authority. You could say, well, um, when the company with all these little shareholders who were passive, you know, management had effective control, and then um, if the company has debt and the management fails to make a debt repayment, then this triggers this bankruptcy procedure um, where, you know, something horrible happens and, uh, you know, the company goes bankrupt, perhaps a judge steps in and starts running things, and, and the managers have less control uh, than before. So there is some sort of analogy there, but it's a bit uncomfortable because um, it involves judges, it involves this nuclear option of bankruptcy, etc., etc. Um, now, just going back to these companies with dispersed shareholders, we do, of course, have, um, and this we've seen this particularly recently, um, a sort of new type of company. Uh, where managers, the founder, has retained control even when the company goes public, like Google, Google Facebook, Snap, etc. So those are companies where you could say, okay, they look like the small companies in that the managers, the founders, have control, they have formal control through dual class shares, and so if these companies have a lot of debt, you could say, well, that's just like the small company case, these guys have control as long as they make the payments, but they lose control if they don't make them. But as, uh, as far as I know, these kinds of companies don't have large debt, and so um, they're not natural candidates for this sort of approach. Um, so with the companies that have a, a, a lot of debt are probably the one share, one vote ones, where, as I say, you know, the man management never had formal control in the, in the first place. However, and here's where I think, uh, and remember that the, the title of this talk uh, has something about the future in it as well, so I think there is a, in recent work, we've seen perhaps a way to move um, a, a new direction, uh, uh, to move it, which might be useful, and that is that to say that even in the case of a one share, one vote company, there is an analogy to the loss of control, and we see it, you know, even putting aside the nuclear option, um, we see it um, in some empirical work that has identified the following effect, that these companies often have a large creditor, a bank, and the debt contract with this creditor contains covenants that if breached, allow the creditor to exert control. So I'm thinking here of the work of Nini, Smith, and Sufi, and I know there are other people who 
topic. So what well, they've identified that um, this kind, of, these kind of contracts exist. They seem important. And what happens if the company um, breaches a covenant? And this is not about failing to repay a debt. Okay, it's not. I didn't. I promised a uh, hundred dollars. I would pay you that, and I failed to pay. It's something more subtle. It's a covenant breach. But when it happens, you, the bank, say, can step in and do something. Um, we, we, it's not a bankruptcy, but um, you may be able to uh, appoint someone to the board, or you may um, be able to put some constraints on my future actions. Um, I have less freedom than I had before. Now, what I think is interesting about this is that it does seem very analogous to what I was talking about in the small company case, particularly when, you know, when I was discussing the Agnum Bolton model. There, it wasn't control shifted um, when a certain state occurred, but that state typically was not the failure to make a payment. And so, it is here. The same thing seems to be happening in large companies. And so you can think of these companies as setting themselves up in such a way that management has control. Let's put aside the, the you know, let's assume the passive shareholders are not intervening too much. I mean, you can have activist investors and so on, but they're not there all the time. So management has a lot of control in um, most of the time. But then, with this uh, contract with the bank, it sort of agreed to give up some of that control if it fails to um, meet some benchmark, if it um, uh, uh, fails to stick to its, its covenants. So, um, of course, the question to ask then is, um, why is this, why, why would such an arrangement be optimal? What you basically have is um, a situation where I, the manager, am going to have effective control um, as long as I satisfy all the terms of my contract with you, but if I fail to do so, control shifts to you. Um, why is that better? I mean, we could have uh, set this up differently. differently. We could have had you be a large shareholder. Uh, instead of having a large creditor, we could have had a large shareholder. But you can see why that actually would be different and possibly worse because with a large shareholder, either manager, either manager would never have control. Or I wouldn't even have effective control because you would always have the power to intervene. This would be a bit like the entrepreneur and the venture capitalist with the entrepreneur giving up all his control to the venture capitalist in the first place and basically becoming uh, become an employee. And that might, you know, I don't think there are many entrepreneurs who uh, are willing to do that. And uh, many managers would not be comfortable with, a, with such an arrangement. They might prefer an arrangement where the investor can intervene, but only on a contingent basis. So the reason to allow the manager to have some independence from the investor is also, by the way, the, the reason why that might be a good idea is also consistent with the work on, uh, by Agnew and Thoreau on uh, formal versus real authority and also uh, the paper by Burkhardt, Brom and Pannunzi um, about how managers who have some independence may actually have an incentive to have more ideas because they know they can implement them. But then they don't have complete independence because if they fail to meet the terms of their uh, financial contract, they lose control. So it may be some sort of, you know, it may be um, some optimal second best arrangement um, when we're trying to allocate control better than giving all the control to a large shareholder. Okay, well, um, the thing that I want to say is, okay, I'm just, these are words that I'm giving you. And um, we like models, and I haven't seen any model that formalizes why the kind of arrangement that uh, Nini, um, Smith, and Sufi identified, why that should be optimal. I've tried to give you some a sketch of, 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 of why it might be better than some other things, but the only way you can really uh, determine this is if you, you know, write down a formal model. Um, similar to the models we have in the financial contracting literature, 
uh, between an entrepreneur and an investor. Uh, so I think there's still a lot of work to be done to take this work by theorists. Um, uh, theory has, has rather, you know, be, become somewhat unpopular. There was a, uh, a great um, burst of theoretical activity in corporate finance um, in the late 80s. But then it sort of petered out, and now everyone's empirical. But I still, I think actually, this is a moment when theorists could come back and start re-examining these questions. Because um, absent a, a good model, I think, now let me go right back to the beginning. I mean, Medina and Miller, uh, Miller um, sort of um, issued a challenge, really. They said, you know, everyone thinks financial structure matters for large public companies. But look, we have a theorem which says under, under not crazy assumptions, it doesn't matter at all. And ever since then, we've been trying to figure out why it does matter. And just to summarize what I've said, I think the initial attempts um, to say it matters be because of agency problems have not been entirely successful because um, there seem to be simpler ways of solving agency problems. Specifically, using uh, incentive schemes, and uh, so, and then I talked about other approaches, and I think, and then people went to the small company case, and perhaps got some insights about the importance of control. And I now think maybe if we uh, apply those ideas to large companies, we might finally be able to get somewhere with uh, why debt matters. But I'm left with the question, so let me put the question in a fairly provocative way. Um, you know, let's take banks. Um, and Marty and Helwig have argued that banks should have much more equity they, than they do because, you know, with debt, they're very fragile. And the only argument one can really have against that is, well, perhaps there's a very important role of debt maybe its value increasing. But, where's the theory to support that? I think we don't yet have it, um, given that it can't just be uh, because of agency problems. And so I think that's why it's important for us to, to do further work, and maybe along the lines that I was talking about, about some sort of uh, control uh, shift, effective control shift, but then uh, that as a, you know, we're saying um, you can design things so that control shifts in more subtle ways than just uh, because the payment is not made, and that might actually mean that we can get the benefits of debt like securities without having the cost of bankruptcy, and who knows, um, perhaps we can make the world a better place uh, by doing that. So I think these are good things for us to be thinking about in the next few years, and that's, that's it. Um, Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, it's probably a little bit incoherent, but uh, um